and Nimble This. Nimble This is the first commercial provider of proactive network maintenance software applications, and this is one of the topics that we're going to be covering today. Uh, thanks for joining us for part two of the live hangout on DOCSIS pre-equalization. If you missed part one, be sure to catch the reruns on our YouTube channel, which you can find on our Volp Firm Google Plus page, or you can also go to our VolpFirm.com blog. Today we're going to be talking more about DOCSIS pre-equalization and to make it, how to make it work for you in locating plant impairments. As last time, my guest is John Downey, consulting network engineer at Cisco Systems. Yesterday was his birthday, so uh, you can be sure to wish him a happy birthday. So welcome back, John. Uh, thanks very much, Brady. <laughs> so. Uh, John, last time, uh, uh, first of all, if you're on Twitter, you can use the hashtag VolpFirm to submit questions to us. We'll, we'll see those and we can answer those. And then also uh, it, on the live uh, Google Hangout, there's a Q&A button. You can click on that and submit questions to us and we'll answer that during the Hangout as we're going on. I do want to mention, uh, I should have mentioned this last time, but there's about anywhere from a 30 second to a one minute delay that Google has in the buffering of the feed. So when John and I are talking to when you actually see uh, what's coming on a feed, there's that delay. So be sure to ask your questions uh, when you have them. They'll come up, we'll see them, we'll answer them. Don't wait till the very end of the Hangout because you might miss getting that question in. Uh, we, we won't actually see it when you get it in for, for us to be able to answer it in time. So get those questions in and we'll answer it. We will keep this hangout brief. This is not going to be an hour-long session. It's going to be about 15 minutes or so uh, in consideration of everyone's time. So uh, getting right into it, uh, John, as a recap from our last hangout, we, you know, we talked kind of about what the basics of pre-equalization is. It's something you can enable in the CMTS and that talks to the cable modems and it helps adapt for upstream impairments and it's it's something that you and I really think highly of and we recommend to uh, most cable operators to turn on it uh, it keeps the modems happy it keeps the subscribers happy when there's impairments in the upstream of even some of the most really bad impairments that we would have so I, I mean you agree with me on this right a hundred percent I mean I'm I'm in the camp that says Let's use all the features we can in the CMCS for self-healing, um, robustness, optimization, speed. Uh, anything we can was invented because it was needed. You know, the mother invention <laughs> is when you need something. Uh, <laughs> um, there are features on the CMCS and in the upstream chipsets and in the modems that help the modem be more resilient. And for us to turn them off, would be the, the saying is cutting off your nose to spite your face. Why would you do something to affect your customer just because your internal processes aren't up to date? Like um, I had customers that said, I don't want ingress cancellation on. I'm like, why wouldn't you want ingress cancellation? Well, I want my RF text to fix the plant. <laughs> I'm like, but you're making your end customer suffer just to teach your RF text a lesson? <laughs> because you don't have proactive monitoring or uh, alarms or flags that tell you when a problem occurs. I, I like to use all the features I can to keep the end customer happy, but I need to be a little bit more proactive in monitoring when modulation changes, how hard the equalizer is working, ingre how hard ingress cancellation is working. I'm not going to look at the SNR, MER of a CMTS alone. I'm going to look at the CNR of a spectrum analyzer. I'm going to have return path monitoring. I'm going to use the flap list. I'm going to use correctable, uncorrectable fact. So there are many parameters I'm going to look at to try to equate to RF problems. Sure. Sorry, I go on. A no, no, no. That's that, <laughs> that's awesome because it leads right into what I want to talk about next. You mentioned the word proactive a number of times, and I know that you're familiar with the uh, one of the working groups at Cable Labs uh, that's called Ingenious. It, it was previously called PNM for Proactive Network Maintenance. And then they, they rebranded it to Ingenious. Uh, and I love the name Ingenious because I always think of Wally Coyote, super genius. So that's that how that name goes in. Um, but the, the Ingenious Working Group focuses on DOCS's proactive network maintenance. And, and really what, what we do in the working group is 
start looking at now deeper at taking the coefficients in the cable modems after pre-equalization has been turned on and, and say, okay, you know, now we're, we're taking advantage of this. Well, what more can we do with these coefficients in the cable modems? So we, we, we extract the coefficients out of the cable modems, the pre-equalization coefficients, and say, now how can we make more meaningful use out of this information? We analyze those coefficients. We turn them into, uh, into equalizer taps that we can see. We analyze that. We take an FFT of those taps. We can see in-channel frequency response. We can then go further and say, okay, now that we have all this information, we can start identifying what those upstream impairments are. We can look at a bunch of cable modems that are having the common upstream impairment and do what's called a correlation. So now we can start saying, you know, here's a group of impairments that have impacting the same cable modems on the same upstream and, and then locate them on the map. So, you know, I, I, it's really cool technology that this group is working on, and it's not the only thing they do. They, they're looking at other things that are happening in the upstream, but I guess what I'm, you know, what I'm interested from you is from the CMTS vendor side, how, how do you see this type of technology impacting the industry, and, you know, what, maybe what else can it do? I'm a, a, a big advocate of P&M ingenious, if you will, because when I troubleshoot RF problems, I know that uh, all the modems coming back in an upstream segment, say the same upstream port, if you will, they'll have the same, technically the same CNR, carry noise ratio, because all the noise funnels back, you know, the noise funneling effect, and all the levels should be hitting the CMTS close to zero dBm. There might be a plus or minus dB here and there, but for all intent and purposes, it should be same CNR. But the MER, which also we call signal to noise ratio, SNR, can be totally different. Every house will see different micro reflections. Every house will see different internal tilt, potentially. Um, so you'll see different MER readings. So the chipset is, you know, a little bit different than just CNR. CNR is just amplitude to amplitude. You know, um, MER is a little bit different. So knowing that, I recommend I turn on pre-equalization. In the CMTS, it's called equalizer coefficient, at least for Cisco CMTS. I activate it. I know the modem is going to pre-distort itself to make up for in-channel impairments, uh, group delay, which is timing issues, and the CMTS will see a nice flat signal and better MER. But now I lose the capability of troubleshooting on my CMTS. So now I need a tool like PNM and Genius to talk to the modems, see how hard they're working, and you talk about you know putting them in groups. I call it clustering. So if I see uh, five modems off of a tap that have the same exact signature, the same pre-equalization signature, I can cluster them and maybe color code them as red. Now I know that if they have the same signature, they must, must be seeing the same problem or impairment in their common path. You know, back when I worked at WaveTech, I used to recommend upstream sweeping with sweep points really, really close but uh, avoiding CB at 27 because I wasn't sweeping to see ingress. I was sweeping to see frequency response and, and, the, and quantify the coax plant and the RF amplifiers and roll off and things like that. So, but any place I didn't have a DOCSIS channel or signal that I knew of, I'd make the sweep points every 200 kilohertz. Sounds like a lot, but I would put a lot of sweep points so I could see better granularity of the upstream sweep. And the more granularity you had, I could use that for frequency domain reflectometry. I don't know if you remember that terminology, FDR. FDR, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And basically, that's what we're doing with the pre-Q taps now, right? If we have an in-channel standing wave, we can look at the peaks of the standing wave, do some mathematics, and tell you how far the distance is. And what I thought was interesting is my feeling was when I did upstream sweep, when I saw that and did the formula, found the distance, I felt, oh, the problem must be 200 feet away from where I'm standing. But what we're finding with the pre-EQ taps and stuff, it's not, the signature is not indicative of a problem from the modem back. It's usually a cavity. And you and I have talked about this, where the cavity might be uh, a bad splice on a, on a connector to an amplifier and a bad inline splice. That's the cavity. It's an impedance mismatch in the line, not impedance mismatch from my house to the line. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, so that, that's so exactly the cavity. Correct. So, so what you have is all these modems that see that same cavity, if you will, they're going to have the same signature because the distance between the two impedance mismatches is the same. It's the same cavity. So you could have 10 modems downstream all 
reporting red because they have the same, if you will, signature. Uh, and then it, the mathematics tells me 300 feet. I look at my cable plan. I'm like, what devices are in the common path of these 10 modems? Working my way backwards towards the head end, that is 300 feet. And I might say, oh, there's a tap there, and there's an amplifier about 300 feet away. Maybe the tap has water in it. Maybe the seizure screw is not tight. Maybe the connector that someone tried to splice together or put together on the amplifier, they drilled out the, the dielectric too far. <laughs> Maybe they used a torch to, to burn off the dielectric. You know, I've seen lots of things. <laughs> it creates a impedance mismatch. So I think it's cool to be able to use P&M. And, and to take a step further, I think with DOCSIS 3.0, if we can start looking at in-channel response, all the channels, and compare, say, four upstream channels, you're almost eating up the whole upstream spectrum anyway. We could utilize that as an upstream sweep point. So yes. instead of me having to go back out and do upstream sweeping, I could just utilize all these modems in the field and see an upstream sweep from every single house that has this capability. Right. right? So, I, I mean, you've covered really a, a couple of really important points with PNM. One when you talk about clustering and, and being able to find that cavity and, and that's a, it's a pretty complex topic that you go into when, when looking at a cavity maybe between an RF amplifier and a passive and saying you know th so we, we have this common point that's impacting maybe 10, 20, 30 subscribers out there so we've identified, we've isolated this pro problem we can plot it on a map and, and tell a technician go out here and, and, and start troubleshooting this area and we, we've done something really important. We've we found a problem, and now we're able to say, don't bother and and go out to this subscriber's house, or don't don't bother and go out to these subscribers' houses and try troubleshooting a problem, because you're never going to find a problem at the subscribers' houses that are calling up and complaining about their service, about modem outages or or bad voice over IP support or problems. You, you, there's the problem is not there. It could be located a mile from their house or two miles from from where their homes are. So now we know you know, we're kind of dissecting where where major problems are and really intelligently telling the technicians go to this place that's really far away from subscribers' homes. And when we when we go there and we fix the problem, we're going to fix a major issue in our outside plant that's going to it's going to make quality of service, quality of experience better for a bunch of subscriber homes. And then, you know, or we may look at the, the P&M tool and we, we may say, you know, there's, there's not an outside plant problem. This is really isolated to an individual subscriber's home. So you can look at it from two ways there. The other thing you talked about is with DOCSIS 3.0 modems, we are using up a lot more upstream bandwidth when we're doing channel bonding. So we do get complete coverage. So there's a double-edged sword there. We can't do sweep when we're doing upstream channel bonding, so we have to look at what other technologies, what different tools in our toolbox do we have. P&M is that new tool in our toolbox, and it's an extremely powerful tool. So, I mean, that, that's, those are great points that you brought up. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I don't want to belittle upstream sweeping because that's what I did. I used to work for WaveTech, and uh, I was still, a lot of times people ask me, John, where should I put my upstream channels? And I'm like, well, you know, a 6.4 megahertz wide channel is wider. It'll have more group delay because it's a wider channel. So if you locate it near the band edge, then if it goes through five amplifiers, it's probably going to see more group delay. With that in mind, I know pre-EQ will make up for some of that. The question is, how much pre-equalization are you willing to give up for a known roll-off issue? Because if you give up all your pre-equalization to make up for the roll-off, then you have nothing left over for just regular micro-reflections and little impedance mismatches here and there and things of that nature. So a lot of times I know the 5 to 42 megahertz upstream spectrum in North America is normally 5 to 40. You know, we both, you and I, worked at Secor Electronics, and remember the Diplex filters, a lot of them dropped to 40 because of the group delay and chromatin and delay on channel 2. So the filters were normally starting to be specced a little bit more shallow, not as tight, not a brick wall filter, 42 to 54. They opened it up a little bit so channel two wouldn't get affected as much with chrome and luminance delay. I'm sure you remember that. Yep. <laughs> you, were, you were working on some of that stuff back then, right? <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. So I know a lot of, you know, the docs and specs is 5 to 42, but a lot of filters out there are 5 to 40. With that in mind, I might still place a 6.4 megahertz wide channel near that band edge. Um, I've had a carry at 38 megahertz, but I definitely had to turn on pre equalization for it to work. 
then when I start placing my other channels, I would normally leave 200 kilohertz of separation between the channels just for sweep points. So to bring this all back around again, even though I'm doing upstream bonding and filling it up with, and I know I'm trying to maybe avoid ham radio and CB and, and uh, telephony and other set-top boxes and things of like that, I can still find some places to put sweep points. And then any places that are empty, I put sweep points really tight to still get a, a more granular sweep in the area where there are no upstream channels. So I don't want to just belittle upstream sweep, but there is a case where maybe we don't have spectrum for upstream sweep. Uh, but if we do separate the channels a little bit, knowing that the sweep points are intermittent as they travel through the spectrum, and the DOCSIS channels are intermittent, and the DOCSIS channels even butted against each other, they still have built-in guard time. You know, a 6.4 megahertz wide channel, how wide really is it? It's 5.4 megahertz, right? The symbol rate is 5.4. So out of, or is it, no, 5.12? 5. Well, the symbol rate is 5.12. Uh, yeah, so out of a 6.4 megahertz channel, we have over half a mega on both sides of really built-in guard time. So we could still probably insert a sweep point right between two channels, even if they're butted against each other. So we could pr probably still get a decent sweep without them interfering with each other. Um, so with that in mind, I think with DOCSIS 3.0, if I ever get to 5 to 85 megahertz and do eight channel upstream bonding, that's a lot of upstream channels that I could utilize to to look at the channel response between channels, levels between channels, frequency response within the channel, potentially an upstream sweep, because I'm looking at all the channels and seeing the whole spectrum. Right. So, so another, uh, an, another challenge that, that I see when, when people are using proactive network maintenance tools is they will see a modem that we have identified as being red. Red meaning that it, you know, the basically the equalizer in the cable modem is indicating there's problems in the upstream, whether it's micro reflections, group delay, or some type of impairment, and the equalizer is being really, really heavily used. So we'll report the problem, the cable modem is being problematic. But on the SNMP dashboard or whatever type of uh, monitoring system the customer or the cable operator is using, everything will look really good. And this goes back to your point, the pre-equalization works really hard and covers up a lot of problems. So SNR will look good, correctable, uh, yeah, correctable, uncorrectable code words, everything's looking good. p and saying, this modem's having a lot of problems, it's working really hard. And so, you know, one of the things we say is this is all part of being proactive. We, we want to we want to go out and fix this modem before its ability to correct for upstream problems runs out in the equalizer itself. Yeah, it, it's like, when is the, where's the straw that broke the camel's back? This kind of scares me because if I turn on pre-equalization and it's masking or it's making up for problems, and I'm only monitoring the CNTS MER and everything looks good, hunky-dory, how do you know the wind doesn't blow and the pre-EQ has to work even harder and it puts it over the edge? So unless you track how hard that modem is working, how stressed the pre-EQ is working, you're not going to know how close it is to the edge. So we need to know how close that thing is and how many modems are close to the edge. For me, I would almost like to see MER from the CMTS perspective before and after pre-EQ. Like, if I don't turn on pre-equalization, what is the MER? If I turn it on and it makes up for 10 dB, I know it's working pretty darn hard. Yeah, that would that so would be. It's not something I'm just going to say walk have. away from. So last time I, I, talked, I know I think I, I think you can do like some of the uh, I think Node Slayer from Charter and Scott Flux from Comcast. That's their terminology for their pre EQ stuff, their application. I know some of them are looking at upstream modulation uh, constellations. And I think extracting from that with and without pre-EQ, kind of like, here's how hard pre-EQ is working. Let's do the mathematics backwards. What would the constellation really look like without pre-EQ? And from that, we can tell what would be the MER without pre-EQ. Right. And I, I also have had um, uh, some people talking about taking modems, cable modems, and uh, as you had recommended last time, taking your test equipment and putting that on on sort of a an OUI uh, uh, exclusion list, so that the those those the test equipment itself is not 
uh, put in, into a pre-equalization mode. I have other uh, cable operators that say they do the same thing with like what they call canary modems. So they can use a cable modem to see what it would look like uh, out in the plant if they did not have pre-equalization turned on. So they, they kind of do the same thing. <laughs> a canary in a coal mine? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's the same concept. So, so we, we have a couple so questions. I thought, uh, Go ahead. Okay. Did, did, so did you, do you know some test vendors doing two modems in their test equipment? Uh, like not, two separate modems in the test equipment? Not two modems. I know that uh, you know, most, most uh, test equipment vendors give you the ability to put multiple, to spoof multiple MAC addresses. So you have yes. the primary yeah, yeah, yeah. MAC address and then you can create a secondary MAC address. So theoretically you could, sure. you could put one MAC address as your pre-equalization MAC address and one MAC address as your non-pre-equalization MAC address. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I was thinking too. Is if you had two modems, or you could had the ability to flip flop, you could you could um, exclude a MAC address from pre EQ, use that MAC address to see the plant. But what if it doesn't even register, right? Maybe it's working so hard that without pre EQ, it wouldn't even come online. Yeah, that's a and great then you point. Flip to the other MAC address. Yeah, flip to to the MAC address with pre EQ, see if it comes online. You say, "Wow, it's, it's some pretty bad stuff going on out here," and uh, that's that's why I won't come online because it's uh, not pre EQ. So we we have a, a couple of questions uh, on the on the Q and A here. Uh, the the first one here is uh, let me select it up. It uh, says uh, currently using my PNM. T tool. Um, I'm not sure what that tool is. I don't know if you know it, John. But one upstream spectrum at 24.2 megahertz, 3.2 megahertz wide, is showing me a warning sign where the upstream at 19.4 megahertz, so slightly lower in frequency, also 3.2 megahertz wide, is showing good health. Why the difference from the same modem? So, I mean, I think there's a, a definitely a lot of possibilities here. But what we're seeing, you know, no, typically you would expect lower frequency. Uh, you'd have more problems here, so there's definitely a frequency dependency going on. Um, definitely could be ingress, uh, some sort of coherent carrier or something at 24.2 or below uh, the 27 megahertz citizens band radio that we'd always recommend people avoiding on that one, correct? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we know CB's at 27, so, the, so where are the two frequencies, 19.4 and 24? Yeah, it's, so the, I mean, the I would one respect the 19 megahertz right of impulse noise. Well, 19.4 is is good. The the problematic one is 24.2, uh, according to their their tool that they're using. That's that's the one. Yeah, and it, you would think it's it, you would think it's so far below the Diflex filter, unless it's a 30 megahertz filter, right? Really old filter. I mean, I've I've run an old plant that's 25 megahertz. Back when you and I were at Secor, I think one of those first upstream spectrums was 25, then 30, then 33. Then yeah. 42, back to 40. So I mean, I've still seen some so 30 I, yeah. megahertz plant out there. That would, you know, that would be the only possibility is if this is really some older plant. Uh, so maybe the the 24.2 is closer to diplex filter. The other thing, and and I've run into this before, is and and I've, I I I like to mention this to people is is there are times where uh, if if you go out and you cut a piece of coax, you know, and, and, and sometimes this is the quick way to disconnect someone from service. You, you cut the coax off the drop rather than disconnecting the coax. <laughs> if that piece of coax makes, especially if it's on a, a low value tap, that piece of coax makes a great notch filter, uh, it, depending yeah. on the frequency. So you can end up with a notch at different frequencies in your upstream, and it turns into group de group delay in your upstream, or or just a suck out, and yeah, basically it, you're notching out the channel altogether. Yeah, so it does become a suck out. So I mean, in this case, you could have a suck out around your 24.2 megahertz, either just above it or just below it, which could be impacting that frequency. So I mean, the thing that you'd want to do is is look at this with either a PNM tool or some type of spectrum analyzer and upstream signal generation tool that can look for things like group delay or something um, but it's you know there's definitely a lot of possibilities with this one yeah I've, I've even seen a case one time where we know the group delay is going to be worse near the diplex photo roll-off but I've had a case where group delay was worse at 30 megahertz than it was at 36 it was totally against the grain it didn't make any sense. It was counterintuitive. Because we're further away from the diplex filter at 30 megahertz, it should work better. 
it turned out some of the filter manufacturers and the amplifier manufacturers, instead of making a 5 to 42 filter, they took a 5 to 30 megahertz filter and created another filter on top of it to, to extend to 42. So you basically had two filters that were kind of crisscrossed right at 30. So on a spectrum analyzer, it would look nice and flat because you would tweak inductors and capacitors to make it look flat, but that didn't mean you had good group delay at that frequency. Right. And it turned yeah. out right at that crossover point because of the components they used and things, it actually had worse group delay right there. I mean, pre EQ made up for it. <laughs> some people think if one filter is better, two or if one filter is good, two <laughs> filters must be better. <laughs> <laughs> they two filters and call me in the morning. <laughs> so I thought there was I thought there was another questionnaire. It it yeah. did you see the other questionnaire? Yeah, okay. so I, I think we kind of covered that, right? Yeah, so it, it is it asked, did you say go ahead? The, the, it, talking about the footage indicated is from the back of the modem to the network. Uh, we've been seeing that the footage indicated seems to be from the common point of the network rather than from the back of the modem. And and that's it, it, that's exactly, exactly yeah. correct. Almost all the time, there are some impairments, uh, especially if if you're looking, if you're using a proactive network maintenance tool. Uh, if you if you have impairments that are in the home and and you're familiar with looking at the equalizer taps on on the cable modem in a PNM tool, the taps that are right adjacent to the main tap, we and we normally call these if it's a 24 port tap. Uh, or not a port tap. If, it, if, it, if it's a, a 24 tap equalizer, which is typically what you have on a on a uh, DOCSIS 2O or DOCSIS 3O cable modem, uh, the main tap is tap eight, and then the tap right after is tap nine and, and tap ten. Uh, those two taps will typically show you indications of in-house or impairments very close to the house, like maybe the drop the drop or the, the tap that's, uh, you know, the, the mainline tap that's going down in. So those are the only times that maybe we could say that we have an impairment that's related to uh, the, the house, and then we can estimate distance from the cable modem. But the majority of the time, we're going to be looking at outside, uh, as John was talking about earlier, micro-reflections that are going back and forth, or, uh, you know, cavities, basically, that are going back and forth. That's, that's the bulk of what we're looking for. Yeah, it's exactly what he said here. You know, uh, most of their problems they're finding is are in the network at a common point. And that's exactly what we we're saying. It's not from the modem. What I was saying is I always thought it was, and it turns out that most of the problems are common to a clustering of modems, meaning it's common in the plant. So it's a cavity. So that cavity gets affected uh, or affects a clustering of modems. So now if I have um, uh, 200 feet is the is the mathematics that decided this distance? Then I look for something or two devices that are 200 feet apart. Um, if um, where was I going with this? <laughs> um, I just lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. That's that's okay. This, this proves that this proves that this is live. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not screwed. We don't it's censor anything here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. So um, I, I think, uh, you know, the last thing I, I want to ask you oh, about, I, John. Hey, wait, wait, wait. Well, you hey, can't. Hey, I, I remember. <laughs> I remembered. I remembered. <laughs> Which kind of like I always thought, I always looked at those tap uh, displays, you know, the, the main tap. And all the taps, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brady, I think this is right. All the taps to the left of the main tap really are indicative of group delay. That's correct. And all the taps to the right of micro-reflections. Correct. So I know that... Um, I could utilize that to kind of focus on anything to the left as group delay problems, anything to the right as, as uh, uh, micro-reflections. And those taps can be equated or calculated into distance to the problem or distance between two problems, if you will, a cavity. And we, like you said, the very first tap, it's such a close distance, typically it's related to the house. Yes. And I know Comcast, they would kind of negate that first tap for their P&M uh, plant evaluation. They knew that that first tap really was in-house problems. Maybe right. it's just the F connector was not tightened down. Yeah, things of that nature. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly exactly what we do. We we negate uh, sometimes we negate both the first and the second tap after the main tap when we're doing correlation uh, to you know looking for groups of modems that have a common upstream impairment, 
and uh, and and like you're saying, the the taps to the the left of the main tap show us group delay. So a lot of times, when you have cable modems that are close to the diplex filter, you'll see all those taps to the left of the main tap really elevated in value, and then you'll have a high group delay group delay level. And so it's, I mean, it's really really quick to see that that when you have group delay problems and using a PNM tool. And then you go and, and, and you can move those modems a little bit away from the, the uh, uh, diplex filter and all of a sudden your, your group delay problems go away and, and your upstream performance improves. So, uh, all right. Very good. So yeah, one of the last things I wanted to ask you, John, was about uh, you know, DSG-based set-top boxes and uh, cable modems embedded in set-top boxes because we also look at those uh, when our, with our P&M applications. And I wanted to get your, your thoughts on, on how you know, maybe that can help um, from your side because that's, uh, you know, that's something that you guys are involved in. If you had any so, thoughts on you that. Know, yeah, I mean, when we see... I, I like the idea of DSG, Docs and Set-Top Gateway, where we have a embedded cable modem. It's, uh, the technology is ubiquitous now. It's everywhere. Um, putting a cable modem in the set-top box makes – there's no out-of-band signaling for the set-top box. But if the set-top box doesn't need any throughput, what am I really doing with that cable modem? Usually the set-top box is deeper in the house, so it's incurring more loss. So we've had cases where we – purposely steered, if you want, that, that's a good word, steered the modem to specific upstreams that were using, say, QPSK, knowing that QPSK could put out more transmit power than, say, 64 QAM. So one, it's more robust. Two, it's more higher power from the set-top box with QPSK, but you're not going to get the throughput. But we also knew we didn't need the throughput. So by pushing certain devices to what I call a quarantine channel, QPSK, maybe maybe even low is 1.6 megahertz wide because maybe you don't need a 3.2 megahertz wide channel because you don't need the capacity. So you steer those devices to that channel. It's more robust. Because it's so narrow, no group delay or hardly any group delay. Because it's so robust, it can survive way down maybe below 15 megahertz. So this is a case where I might utilize the cable modem in a set-top box at lower frequencies. Now, in regards to PNM, um, if it's on a really small channel, I might not get as much from it because it is a 1.6 megahertz channel, right? Sure. I really never went down that path of will PNM be advantageous for set-top boxes. I mean, having more devices that you can pull and get levels from is always great. But for PNM purposes, I don't know that that device with a smaller channel width is going to give me as much useful information. I don't know. What, I mean, are there are there thoughts that you had about the set top box? No, I I, I don't. Uh, I have a client uh, that that I've been working with that has a, a ton of set top boxes, and they were interested in what type of information and whether or not it would be valuable for them to get from it. So, and I was interested and curious as to what your thoughts are. But you're all right. The, because the set top boxes are so deep in the home, they use typically like like a, a 1.6 megahertz QPSK channel. So it is questionable as to, to what value that's going to be. Now, there's a lot of set-top boxes. So you do get a lot of points of data. You also get points of data that are very low, you know, sort of on a lower frequency spectrum because they're typically down below 20 megahertz or, you know, in that, in that range. But um, it's, it's questionable as to how valuable that data is going to be. Yeah. And by the way, Brady, I mean, since we're, you know, ad-libbing here going back and forth, are you on the 3-1 working group? Or any of the working groups for three one box so, three one. So the ingenious working group uh, puts together sort of the recommendations for P and M requirements on on that go back into the three one working groups, and and mm -hmm. it's, it's it's actually a good segue. There's a, there are a ton of really really cool features that are going to be. Uh, P and M features that are going to be in in part of that are part of three one standard. So we look at what we have right now as far as three one capabilities in our current Doxis two o one one three o modems, and and they're I mean they're really amazing what we can do. But when we look at three one, it's it's an order of magnitude more. Um, the, the features that we're adding into that because we you know we kind of know what limitations we have now and we say well we don't want those limitations in the future we want to add a whole bunch more features into uh, the the new 
equipment that's going to be coming out, the cable modems, the CMTSs. Um, yeah. So uh, it's, it's yeah, if, if my awesome. upstream is, If my upstream is now a 48 megahertz wide OFDMA signal with, sing, with uh, many carriers in between, it's, the question is, like, how do the taps really going to work on this huge channel that's made up of many sub-channels? But then again, the many sub-channels can all change level for in-channel problem, in-channel tilt problems. Or um, I was just curious if you know you had any insight on where we were going with some of that stuff as well. I'm glad they're looking at that now, you know, instead of waiting till later. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, it is. We're going to have every sub-carrier. So I mean, and we're, we'll be having literally thousands of sub-carriers on the upstream and downstream. So every one of those subcarriers will basically give us the ability to do PNM analysis. But also, in addition to that, we're going to have the ability to do, if you're familiar with noise power ratio tests, NPR tests, we're going to have the ability to do that in channel while while the system is active. We'll be able to see ingress under the carrier for, you know, be able to turn that on and turn it off very quickly uh, with the OFDM channels because you can knock a channel out and turn it back on because there'll be other subcarrier channels that are still running. So there's there's just a lot of cool things, cool features that we'll be able to to do uh, as part of the whole proactive network maintenance initiative in in three one. All right, so, very good. So uh, so there was one, question. Yeah, one more question came in. It talks about uh, the the spectrum analyzer, which is something I didn't cover. Um, we we do you know part of the. Uh, Ingenious Working Group is is we look at other features that we can do, um, not just looking at equalizer coefficients, but taking advantage of things like spectrum analysis in the CMTS, upstream spectrum analysis in the CMTS, downstream spectrum analysis in the cable modems. So um, that's that's uh, you know other other things that really add a lot more value. And so one of the things that, that uh, we do in, in the Nimble this product is that the upstream spectrum analyzer that takes advantage of capacity in, in, this, in the CMTS. So it's, it's a really cool feature. And you can see your upstream um, on, on the CMTS upstream spectrum, and it doesn't require you know, head-end cabling and stuff like that. So it just uses the spare FFT that's in the Broadcom chipset. So that's a, a, so a nice you're, you're feature to so your application is pulling the CMTS with a read-only string and just bring, and pulling that information? Well, you, you need both the read-only string and the read-write string. So um, okay. so getting the read-write string has some interesting uh, discussions with the, this, the uh, system admin sometimes because uh, they don't necessarily want to give that out unless they know that yeah. you know where it's going, who has access to it, and, and what you're doing yeah. with it. And basically... You need the, the read-write string because you have to set the start and stop frequency and resolution bandwidth of the spectrum analog of the of the uh, FFT that's in the Broadcom chipset uh, in order to to create a spectrum analysis view. And, I, I've uh, had yeah, I've, I've I've had that same apprehensiveness, I guess, about the, having the need for a read-write string, and I usually recommend just an access list. Yes, yeah, so an access list, you know, for the device that's going to be accessing that information. No one else can get to it. Yeah, we we recommend that they create a separate spectrum, uh, uh, a separate read-write string just for the application, and then create the ACL, you know, that limits it yeah. just to the IP of the uh, PNM server, and that way it's it's restricted at that point. So we, you know, only only let it, uh, only give it certain pr pr privileges. Yeah. So. I mean, it sounds very, uh, very much the same like uh, Cisco CBT, Cisco Broadband Troubleshooter, which yep. I think it really kind of is. And what I like the advantage of is if you're pulling the CMTS and the CMTS does all the scheduling of upstream traffic, even if you have 90% upstream traffic, you can still use the tool to query the CMTS upstream chip and say, show me the upstream with no traffic. So basically, you can see noise under the carrier, you yeah. know, like ingress under the carrier, if you will. Yeah, I've yeah. Even, we, I've even utilized it. I've even utilized it during that quiet time, saying, "Show me the upstream with no traffic," and I saw traffic, and I knew it could have been an isolation issue in the head end, where signal destined for upstream one was showing up on upstream zero. So right. it's being scheduled for upstream 
one, but it's finding a path in the head end because of isolation issues showing up on upstream zero. And I knew that there was a way for me to see that uh, with the, this application. Yeah, it's, it's funny you mentioned that. I have a client that I, I, I thought for some time there was maybe an issue with their CMTS because it doesn't quite work right. Um, they, as I'm always seeing traffic that I should not be seeing on, on their spectrum an, on the upstream spectrum analyzer, but now now I'm wondering if it's not just a head end isolation issue that's been. Uh, uh, we always see this upstream traffic that we never should see, and uh, it, it is probably it's just an isolation issue. It could be. A lot of people will come up to me and say, "Is there enough isolation between your ports on the CMTS?" I'm like, "Yeah." I said, "It's probably isolation in your head end." You know, because a lot of times your your service groups for different applications are different, like the upstream sweep could be eight nodes combined, but your CMTS is one to one. So if you follow all the paths that signals can take, you usually can find a path where it can bleed over. Right. Okay. Well, sir, I think that, uh, that pretty much covers everything we can cover. Uh, in, in this time period, we've uh, we've gone 41 minutes, well past what we had intended on going, but that's what happens on a Friday when we add lib. So, thanks very much for your time today. Um, perhaps we'll get together and, and do this again on another topic if you're interested in it. Uh, thanks everyone who uh, showed up and, and uh, hung with us on a Friday. Happy Friday, everyone. Have a great weekend, and uh, we'll talk to everyone again soon. So, John, you take care. Have a great weekend. All right, take care. Happy uh, Dos de Mayo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see you. All right, bye. Bye-bye.